Good morning, good morning, good morning to all. I am so glad that you have joined me for a Shabbat word on this Sabbath day morning. I hope that you are blessed and favored by the Lord on this day. Shabbat shalom to all. Uh, I go ahead and grab something to drink, whether it be your coffee, your water, or protein shake, or a smoothie. Go ahead and get it and get your word of God out. Whatever device uh, you use to read from the word, go ahead and take it out. Your Bible, your iPad, or or your Kindle or whatever device you might have. And we're going to be studying Matthew chapter 12 today. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Shabbat Shalom, Mrs. Annie Reese. Thank you for joining me this morning. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to God. We're going to give uh, a few people just a couple of minutes to join us for this morning. The title um, is in the description. Good morning, Pastor Thomas Brown. Thanks for joining me also. Shabbat Shalom to you. Yes, Matthew chapter 12. We're going to be studying Matthew chapter 12 today. And we're going to take a look at how Yeshua handled the busybodies. How Yeshua handled some busybodies. I'm going to start off with a word of prayer. Father God, I come before you today in the name of your son, Yeshua. I come thanking you for this day and this hour. I thank you for this time of study. I ask that you will open up the hearts of your people to receive this word. Speak through me and speak to me clearly. In the name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen, amen, amen. Um, from Matthew's gospel, chapter number 12, we're going to be walking the scriptures, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8 to be exact this morning. We're going to start with verse number one. Verse number one reads like this. At that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on Shabbat. His disciples became hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat them. That is verse number one. We notice here in verse number one, we notice two events that occur in this one verse. Event number one, at that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on Shabbat. Verse number one, at what time? I'm glad you asked. On the Sabbath. At what time? On Shabbat. S-H-A-B-B-A-T. Don't let that trip you up. It means Sabbath. That is the time. It tells us here on the Sabbath. Um, and I want to take just a minute to explain to you um, what the Sabbath is for Sabbath day keepers. It is the day that they remember the Lord and they keep his day holy uh, it, and they reverence this day from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday. Me Messiah Yeshua here is with his disciples. Good morning, good morning, good morning to all who are joining me. They are traveling through a grain field. When? On the Sabbath, that is correct. The Sabbath is the Jewish day of worship. As I said, it begins at sundown Friday and it ends at sundown Saturday. And according to the Ten Commandments, Pastor Brown, they were taught to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Uh, that comes from Exodus chapter number 20, verses 8 through 11. For those of you who have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to take a look at that, at what Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11 have to say regarding the Sabbath. Let's go ahead and look at it. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. It reads like this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall be no you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here in verse number one, it says that Yeshua and his disciples were traveling, good, good morning, were traveling through a grain field or a corn field uh, on the Sabbath. Event number two, the second thing that we see right here in verse number one, it says his disciples became hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and eat them. His disciples became hungry. They saw the grain and they began to pluck it and to eat it. Now, if we read this sentence alone, if we read this sentence in isolation, it appears, Minister Frazier, that there is no problem. However, when we couple this second sentence with the first sentence, now we see a potential problem. Remember, what was, what was happening at this time? It was the time of the Sabbath. And I just read to you Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, that explain how the Sabbath was considered and what it was and what they were not to do on this particular day. Now, what I need to do right now, I would like to tell you um, how important or to give you an example of how important the Sabbath is for Sabbath day keepers. Over in Israel, even until this day, if you ever get to visit Israel, hopefully I will on one day, but if you ever go to Israel, there are hotels, Jehiah, in Israel that have what is called a Shabbat elevator. Yes, all of the elevators in the hotels are not Shabbat elevators, but in the hotels, there is a Shabbat elevator. And, it, and, and from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday, this particular elevator in many of the hotels is programmed a certain way. Now, for example, if you had a room in this hotel and your room was on floor number five, once you get into the elevator, there is no need for you to press the button because it doesn't matter if you press it or not. It is not going to take you directly to floor number five. What is going to happen if, in fact, your room is on floor number five, when the, when, if you're at ground level, when the elevator goes from ground level to one, the doors will open. People will get in, people will get off, the doors will close. It will go to floor two. The doors will open, people will get on, people will get off, the doors will close. And it will continue to do this until it reaches floor number five or whatever floor your room happens to be on. And the reason for this is because it is designed for those who practice Shabbat or who practice keeping the Sabbath. And it is designed to do this so that they do no work. Because if in fact they press the button that is considered work. Why? Because it ignites some type of electrical spark and it is considered work. So that is how important the Sabbath is for Sabbath day keepers. Now, here in our text, here in our text, we're in Matthew chapter 12, Deacon Jackson, uh, Ms., Mrs. Story, those of you who are joining us. We're in Matthew chapter 12. It says that Yeshua and his disciples, Yeshua and his disciples are traveling through a field on the Sabbath. Now, the first thing I see in this particular text is preparation. It is preparation. Now, now although this is not the tenor of this particular text, 
preparation is definitely in this text. Now, I'm going to show it to you. Apparently, my brothers and my sisters, the disciples had miscalculated the time that it would take to do whatever previous mission they had been on. Apparently, they did not take into account that it was going to take as long as it took. Why do you say? I'm glad you asked. Because those who keep the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath is called the day of preparation. It is the day whereby they prepare all of their meals. They do any cleaning. They do any uh, ironing and drying and washing of the clothes. They prepare for the Sabbath so that when the Sabbath begins, there is not work that is done. So apparently, and you know, sometimes we we have delays in life. So perhaps maybe there was a delay. Maybe Jesus was out performing miracles and it took longer than they, attend, they, they intended. It does not tell us. But what we do know is that they had not prepared food for the Sabbath day. They had not brought food with them to last until the Sabbath was over. Their time of preparation, remember, the preparation for the Sabbath is the day before the Sabbath. Now, that's so so the thing that's the first thing I want to point out here today is preparation. Now, I want to talk the reason I want to point out preparation here is because I believe we live in a day and a time when many people fail to prepare. That's right. And somebody said if you fail to pre if you if you fail to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So I want to let you know today that we still need to prepare. Somebody type in preparation. There was a time in our society, my brothers and my sisters, and I believe, Miss Wilburn, some of us who have had just a few birthdays will agree with me that we prepared for Sunday morning. We would get the children's clothes out. We would lay them out on Saturday night. We would iron everything. We would have everything to a T, from the socks to the shoes to everything. And, and, and there was some mamas now there were some mamas in preparation who even prepared the dinner so that when church was over on Sunday all they had to do was sit down and partake of that which they had prepared I'm talking about preparation why is that important I'm glad you asked because in the day and the time that we live in we all need to be prepared that's right the Bible says in Matthew's gospel chapter number 24 Verse number 44, it says, be ready when he comes. Therefore, be ye also ready for an hour that you think not the son of man cometh. And I don't know about you, but when he makes his return, I want to be ready to go. Anybody out there on this Sabbath day morning want to be ready to go? Then you've got to be prepared today. You've got to prepare today on where you will spend your eternity. Will you spend eternity with him or will you be will you spend eternity without him? I don't know about you, but I want to spend eternity with him in that great getting up morning. Glory to God. I want to be with him. We're talking about preparation. That's the first thing. I want to be in that number, Minister Frazier. Yes, stay ready. Stay ready. Somebody said if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So the disciples had not prepared food for the Sabbath. Their lack of preparation, here it is, don't you miss this, led to the Pharisees' accusation. That's point number two. Point number one, pre preparation. Point number two, accusation. Their lack of preparation led to the Pharisees' accusation. It's right here in verse number two. Look at verse number two. My Bible readers in the house, I need you to look at verse number two. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not permitted on Shabbat. That's right. Yes, sir. They were hungry. They were, they are doing what was not permitted on Shabbat. Here in this verse, the Pharisees are accusing Yeshua and his disciples of breaking the law. According to the Torah, the fourth commandment to be exact, they were expected to do what? Remember the Sabbath 
and to keep it holy. That was the written law. However, my brothers and my sisters, the Jews also had an oral law which included strict details on the written law. It included strict details on how the written law was to be implemented. The written law and the oral law form what is called the halakha. H-A-L-A-K-H-A. -H -A. It is a collection of both the written and the oral law. Let's dissect verse number two. It says, but when the Pharisees saw this. Now the Pharisees were the religious leaders of that day. They were devout keepers of the Old Testament law. Not only did they keep the written law, Mrs. Reese, but they also kept the unwritten law or the traditions of man. And according to verse number two, the Pharisees saw this. What is this? I'm glad you asked. They saw, they were busybodies. They were somewhere lurking and looking around. They saw Yeshua's disciples picking grain out of the field on the Sabbath day. They saw them picking grain from the field on the Sabbath day. Somebody might say, what was wrong with this? They were hungry. Why was this a perceived problem? I'm glad you asked. Picking the grain on Shabbat would have been considered work according to their traditions of man. It would have been considered work. Isn't it interesting, my brothers and my sisters, how the Pharisees seem to always be lurking and watching Yeshua and his disciples? I'm talking about busybodies. Isn't it interesting, my brothers and my sisters, how the Pharisees always seem to trek to, to try to catch Yeshua in a snare. I'm talking about busy bodies. Isn't it interesting how the Pharisees were always trying to discredit the Lord's work. They were always trying to find fault in his mission. There are people in your life, there are people in my life who just don't want us to shine. They're always trying to find fault. They're always trying to discredit everything we do. They want to catch you in a snare. That is their purpose. Because the Pharisees were the keepers of the law, they were well aware of what was permitted and they were well aware of what was not permitted. Yes, sir. They were lurking in the field. You know, they were probably out there just waiting, saying, oops, I gotcha. And when they saw them doing that, they, they jumped out, I gotcha. They were lurking in the field. So the Pharisees were, were well aware of what was permitted and what was not permitted. And it was their duty to point out all of those who were not in compliance. But apparently, apparently, my brothers and my sisters, I don't want you to miss this. The Pharisees did not realize who they were dealing with. They were talking to the Lord of the Sabbath. That's right. They did not realize who they were talking to. Uh, that was their accusation. Now, Yeshua handles the accusation with an explanation. And we're going to look at that. That's our third point. The act that, that we looked at preparation, we looked at accusation, and now we're going to look at how he chooses to handle this with an explanation. And this explanation is found in verses three through eight. He uses a series of questions to respond to the Pharisees. In so doing, Yeshua challenges their interpretation of the law. In all thy getting, get understanding. I need somebody to know that this morning. In all thy getting, get understanding. Good morning, Deacon Brown. Rules and laws, my brothers and my sisters, are established to maintain order. That's the purpose. That's why we have rules. That's why we have laws in society to maintain order. The religious leaders of that day were overly uh, concerned about the rules and they were overly concerned about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. 
Look at verses three through five. He said to them, haven't you read what David did when he became hungry and those with him? How he entered into the house of God and they ate the showbread? Verse number four, which was not permitted for him to eat, nor for those with him, but only for the Kohanim or the priests. So he, he's reminding them just in case they forgot. He's reminding them and they probably didn't forget. They were just hoping that they would catch him in a snare. They were hoping that he would know. But this is what they, this is what Yeshua said to them. He says, how he entered into the house of God and they ate the showbread. He's talking about David and his men when they were on the run from Saul. The Messiah starts the question with the phrase, haven't you read? In other words, he's telling them, you read it, but it is clearly you didn't understand what you read. The Messiah knew the word, my brothers and my sisters, don't miss this. He reminded them of David's account, which is found in 1 Samuel chapter number 21. That's right. Yeshua knew the word because he was the word. Now the Lord, Yeshua, does not condemn David nor his men for eating the showbread. This is to remind us that a necessity, get this, is more important than a ritual. Why did they go into the temple to eat the showbread? Because they were hungry. Why did Yeshua's disciples pick the grain out of the field to eat it because they were hungry. So the Lord reminds them that necessity is more important than a ritual. Glory to God. The implication here is that there are times in your life, there are times in my life when you have to bypass protocol, Mrs. Reese, and do that which is necessary. Somebody type in, it is necessary. Yeshua asks a question, another question in verse number five. Let's look at it, verse number five. This is what he says. Or haven't you read in the Torah that on Shabbat, the Kohanim or the priests in the temple break Shabbat and yet are innocent. So he gives them not one example in his explanation, but he gives them two examples. We're still in verse number five. The priests work in the temple on the Sabbath and are not guilty for working on the Shabbat because they have done no wrong. Now, the Messiah knew the word. Why did he know the word? I'm glad you asked because he was the word. In John's gospel chapter number one, verse number 14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among men. Here's the point. Here's the point. Don't miss this on this Sabbath day morning. Know the word. Yeshua is our example. He knew the word. That is how he was able to use the word in his explanation for their accusation. He was able to use the word to combat their accusations. He was able to use the word for these busybodies who were watching, who were lurking. He was able to give the busybodies a word from the book. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 verse number 11. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119 verse 105. And then a New Testament scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? The word of truth. Verse number six, let's move on. Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. 
one greater than the temple. Who is he talking about? He's referring to himself. Would somebody type in the chat, God is greater. How many people know that he's greater than your problems? He's greater than your dilemma. He's greater than whatever it is you're dealing with right now. God is greater. Yeshua is greater. The word is greater. He is greater. Somebody type it in greater. In verse number Number five, the Lord had just told them that the priests didn't break the law because it was their duty to work in the temple on the Sabbath. But based on the Pharisees, they had broken the traditions of men. Remember, we talked about how the Halakha, the capital H-A-L-A-K-H-A, -H -A, it is a compilation of the written law and the traditions of man. So they didn't break the the, the, the law, they broke the traditions of man according to the Pharisees. Remember, I taught you earlier what the Jewish law consisted of. It, it consisted of the written law and the traditions of man. Glory to God. Let's move on. Glory to God. You see, the written law told them what to do. Their oral law or their traditions of man told them how to do it. In the case of this text, the Most High God gave them their written law when he said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Man's interpretation and extension of God's law stated how they were expected to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. It was a list of of a whole lot of rules. It was a list of a whole lot of rules, glory to God. And the Pharisees were lurking, trying to see who was in violation of these rules. Yeshua reminds the Pharisees that there is one greater than the temple, and he's referring to himself. He is the connection here. This is how the Lord ties it all together. Just as it was necessary for David to eat the bread, just as it was necessary for the temple priest to eat the bread, it is also necessary for the disciples to eat the grain. Yeshua wanted the Pharisees to understand that in the event of a necessity, you must do what you have to do. In other words, don't ignore the need for a ritual. Verse number seven. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the innocent. And he tells them, he chastises them using the word here. He says, this is what he says. He says, if you truly understood what this meant, you would not have chastised me for allowing my disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. You would have given us mercy because if you truly understood this, you would have known that this was a necessity. Glory to God. And he quotes from Hosea chapter six, verse number six, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. That is where that phrase comes from. Hosea chapter six, verse number six. Hosea was telling the people that God wanted more from them. For what I want not, animal sacrifices, but mercy. And I believe that God is calling us to do more. He wants more from us. He says, I want my people to know me as God. God is more interested in a relationship as opposed to the ritual. Verse number four, that last verse, for the son of man is Lord of Shabbat. The son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. The importance of Yeshua's explanation, my brothers and my sisters, to the Pharisees' accusation was so that the reader could get an understanding. In all thy getting, get understanding. So that they could get an understanding of meeting a need versus 
following a ritual. It is, it is to show us how the Pharisees were overly concerned about the rules and the laws, but they were loosely concerned about people and their necessities. Human needs supersede these rules. Glory to God. That is our word on this Shabbat morning. I pray that this word has been a blessing to you, for you. Uh, remember to like it. Uh, remember to tag someone, share this word with someone and what we've just discussed and prayerfully that this word has been a help to you that is going to bless your soul. From Matthew's gospel, chapter number 12, verses one through eight, how Yeshua handled the busy bodies. And remember, he teaches in these verses that necessity supersedes the protocol. Glory to God. Thank you so much for joining me on this Sabbath the day morning. Thank you, Miss Annie Rees, Pastor Thomas Brown, Minister Frazier, uh, Miss Story, uh, Miss Butler. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, my Miss Miss Isella Wilson, Miss Philpot. Thank you for joining me. Um, remember to keep walking with God, and God will walk with you. Until next time, be blessed. <music>